really would like to get people chatting today. Uh, so if you want to type chat messages, if, if you don't have questions after today's presentation, I don't know if there's going to be questions because this is going to be some really good information. Hopefully we have your gears are turning, your, your thought cooker is processing, and we really want to hear your questions. Please let us know uh, what you want us to ask um, Gary, David, or uh, Jabin. So uh, David, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Brenda. All right. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, so as Brian said, I'm David Weichel. I teach family consumer sciences in Glenwood City School District. Um, I also do have uh, the position of the Youth Apprenticeship Coordinator here in district. Uh, just a little bit of background. This is technically only my sixth year working with Youth Apprenticeship. Um, I've done it uh, starting out with two students. Um, I've gone up to, I think, as high as six or seven one year. And this year is back down due to, you know, that fun COVID pandemic that we're in and all the different interesting things that have come out of that. Um, to be honest, quite a few of my students, uh, possibly as high as about 50% of my students, I would say, um, have been identified either with a 504 or an IEP. Um, when I'm going out looking for students to participate in the program, I actually do, uh, to a certain extent, um, target those students. A lot of times they're the ones who appreciate the hands-on application of being at work and getting not just work experience and getting paid for it, but also getting that um, school credit for the that job as well. Um, so I go to them, I talk to them, try and find out kind of where they're at, where they wanna be. Um, sometimes they have no idea what they wanna do. And I try and introduce this as a possible way of, um, you know, trying something out for a year. And if it sticks, they might have a long-term career out of it. Um, next person I'm going to introduce is going to be uh, Gary Freiberg. Uh, he is the director of operations at Nalato Contour in Baldwin. Um, I have worked with him with two different students. Um, the first student was, I think, three years ago, um, who was identified with a 504. Um, and then later on in that same year is when um, we started with our second student, who is Javen. Um, and you'll be hearing from him a little bit later in this um, presentation. So, uh, Gary, if you would like to, you can go ahead and talk a little bit from the employer perspective for the YA program. Okay. And... Let me grab the screen here just for a second. Gary, I gave you back sharing rights so you can share your screen. Okay, thank you. No problem. So the all of this kind of blends together into uh, what we're doing with WITC for, for our um, apprenticeship program. And the individual that I work with at WIT is Eric Lockwood, he's the Divisional Dean for Continuing Education and Apprenticeship. And so what started out with um, Julie Foss, she is our VP of Finance, and, and she knew that we were struggling with getting uh, uh, basically kids who are interested in manufacturing to learn about manufacturing and, and potentially uh, become work uh, employees for us in technical roles that, that they could make a good living off of. And so she worked with the local uh, high school, Baldwin Woodville High School, and started work with them to, to get a program together. And then once uh, her and I can't remember her counterpart, but once they got the, the process going, they ended up going to the other local schools uh, for instance, Gledmont City, and said, okay, you know, we're looking for these types of uh, kids, if you would, and, and what we have to offer is uh, a way for a person to learn skills that they could earn a good living with over the, the, their working livelihoods. And so Julie Foss started doing that, and uh, David, for instance, came over with a group of kids and we have, I think it's about a four hour event here with them. We go through the facilities, we take them on the floor, uh, we show them that manufacturing isn't a dirty area and, and try to build up some interest. And four of these that you see here, Matt Pribble, Caleb, 
Will Buffington and Jabin, all four of these young guys went from being a youth apprentice. Uh, they got here, they started working with us. The, we're really flexible on our schedule so they can still play sports um, and, and band and, and those types of things. And then come in and work, start learning a skill. And these four said, you know, I, I'm not really interested in going to, to university. I, I want to learn a skill that I can and be working on and, and, and go with that. So uh, with that, they make the transition from youth apprentice to registered apprentice. And that's where I get involved with Eric at WITC. And we start placing these individuals into the different um, uh, apprenticeship programs that work well for what we're looking for as a company and what these students are looking for is what they would like to do for their livelihood. And then not only that, we've broken into taking just regular personnel from our floor. Um, I think if you look over on this side, these are people that this was an operator, a machine operator, machine operator, and, and some technicians. And they showed an interest in getting into what we call technicians. And a technician, for example, at our company, can they start out about $17 an hour and they can work their way up to $30 an hour as a technician without having to go to university, for instance. Uh, they go to the, the uh, WITC, the part of the, the apprenticeship program, and then they can move on to really, really good careers. And then lastly, we have Pete Koenig, and, and he's a program manager here, and he works with Stout to bring in uh, engineers into the program. So we attacked it going with, we need RAs to grow them into, I'm sorry, YAs to grow them into RAs. And then for our engineering, we capped it off with uh, just the overall recruitment policy. Now, here's the really cool thing about it. These four young guys, they come in here, no preconceived ideas. Uh, we teach them what we would like them to see and how we would like them to do work at our company. And then we send them to school. And Jabin is the most recent one. He just finished up at uh, his military training and started working for us as a technician, apprenticeship technician. And what I get from the manager in the area that he's in is, oh my God, he's the only one that's not missing these details of our processes. So they're supposed to go in and they verify their processes. They're looking for changes. And Jabin comes in and, and he brings up, hey, uh, his manager's name is Alec. Hey, Alec, this, this thing here, it's not right. It's what, what's going on? And all these other technicians who have years of experience miss it. And so that's the, the beauty of it. These young guys come in and we say, here's how we want to run the business. And they go, okay, we'll run the business that way. And uh, the old timers, not necessarily age-wise old timers, but experience, they, they just miss it. And so not only can we not find technical help in the area, unemployment is it, killing us trying to find this but they also do it the way we want to run the business. And it's very difficult to bring in people with experience that can help us run the business with the way we want. Now, it doesn't mean we don't look for uh, experienced help, but what we're, we're seeing is if we blend in the youth apprentice and the RAs with experience, the two of them put enough uh, kind of rubber band tension stuff to pull in a really good running team at our facility. And it's, we started it just about the same time David was talking. About six years ago, we really started getting traction with it. In all the years, I think we've had two YAs that didn't work out. When they got here, they just realized uh, one of them wanted to be an electrician and, and he wasn't gonna get there through us. And that was all right, it's just a learning experience. And the other kid, um, sometimes you take a chance on a kid and, and it just didn't work out with them. And that was all. But, but overall, we're really, really pleased at the results that we're getting from 
the work that we're doing with the, the schools. Oh, let me give you back your screen. Is there any questions about how we do it? And if not, we'll, we can answer them later, awesome. Just gonna say, we don't have any yet in the chat, but I encourage you to drop questions that you have in the chat and we can always come back um, to Gary too. Yeah. So, uh, Gary, you do you live in the Baldwin area? So you have- I live in Hudson. To, okay, so you, you have connections to Baldwin and then you have connections to Glenwood City and the school districts kind of around that area. So you're recruiting from a, a couple yeah. of different school districts. Probably about 25 mile radius is, is where we're pulling from. Okay. And, and there's not enough of them. Even with all that, we can't find enough of these young guys and gals. And, and that's the story that this is why we have a community of practice. We're bringing people together to talk about some really serious topics that lend themselves to students with disabilities need to be connected to career and technical education. Uh, the, the last webinar, we showed some national data that said it increases graduation rates and increases their ability to uh, maneuver through school with less behavior issues. Uh, and they graduate more focused on a person-centered plan that's going to lead them to a tangible outcome. So I think it's time now for, for us to introduce the, the real reason why we're here is to to, to showcase Jabin and the things that he's been doing um, at Nulato. And uh, I asked David if he would uh, ask uh, Jabin some questions. Uh, so we, we've we been meeting periodically here for the last month uh, to get ready for, for, for this webinar. And um, I'm excited to, to let you hear from Jabin. All right, so I guess that means that it's time to uh, introduce Jabin. Um, so Jabin Hoyam um, is a former Glenwood City student. Um, currently, he is 18 years old, working full time at Nolato, obviously, since that's the business that we've been talking to. Um, not only is he doing that, but he is also in the Army Reserves and with a military occupational specialty in uh, power as a power generation technician. Um, he does have quite a few hobbies that he likes to do, including uh, camping and canoeing. Um, also, kind of like what Gary had said uh, earlier, uh, Jabin was still able to participate in other events at school, even though he was doing a youth apprenticeship experience. Um, he participated in cross, cr cross country, um, track and wrestling, was part of the band program, um, as well as participated in Skills USA. Um, outside of school, he did participate in 4-H. Um, where he is per, has shown dairy for 10 years at the St. Croix County Fair, um, and some of his first jobs were actually uh, working on farms in the area. Um, he has a primary um, disability of dyslexia, um, specifically with focus. Um, he continues to improve and util utilize his self-advocacy skills, um, basically learning how to ask for help and tell people what his needs are to make sure that he is able to be successful wherever he is at. A um, few highlights for him from the CTE programming. Uh, he did complete a uh, dual enrollment coursework um, in welding through our tech ed uh, teacher. Uh, he completed both a level one and level two YA um, at Nolato while he was attending school here. Um, he technically did it in a little bit less time than a few other students do. Um, as he started out um, about halfway through the first school year, which is his junior year, um, as juniors are uh, the youngest group of students that are able to be signed up for the YA program. So uh, basically, welcome, Jabin. And I guess if you're ready, I'm going to start asking you a couple of these different questions that uh, we have come up with for you. Ready whenever. All right. Um, so first question is, was there any connection between your participation in YA level one and two um, and your ability to better understand your disability? and find ways to accommodate it to be successful? Uh, yes, I did find better ways to improve throughout level one and level two to accommodate for my disability. Um, with Nolato, we have 
uh, specific work packets that we always have to read and to understand what our job is for entailing of these parts. And so for me, it was hard to uh, understand what it was asking of at first. So I'd always have to try and go a little bit higher than what my position was to ask more questions. And that was more of my level one of asking, okay, what do I need to do for most of these jobs that we have in factory? And then for level two, um, I was able to improve a little bit in the factory to where they moved me into an assembly room. And there I was able to do a little more hands-on and understand more things needed for my disability of having to work better with people and see how they cooperate. Thank you. Um, second question that we had for you is, um, what helped you to get connected to CTE involvement um, or basically like what made the magic happen for you? Um, for me, it was uh, my junior year. Um, we were able at the school of Glenwood City, we were eligible to take a small group of kids out to an auto to actually tour the factory. And um, really, I just looked at the factory and I was, interested on becoming a part of what they do and helping everybody in the world. All right. Um, so what are some different highlights or memories that you can share from your participation in the YA program? Um, some of the good highlights that I found is that it really helps stable a good starting base for everybody. It, really gives you a small platform of this is what the work life really feels like. And for me, I started working at Mulatto when I was 16. So it was a really good um, way to feel on how it actually is to work at a young age. So we, when we start getting into higher levels of these programs, you already have a small base of knowledge and it helps with going into better projected, uh, proje better projects going forward. All right, some good information there. Um, so fourth question is, what are some of the lessons that you have learned about high school courses um, and the decisions on how it connects to what happens after high school? So with that one, a lot of the courses I've taken my freshman and sophomore year of high school were mainly focused on just really generally anything than a specific way to go. Uh, and then when my junior and senior year hit of high school, I focused it a little bit more on some shop classes to help me go into hands-on jobs which were a little bit better for me with my disability. And instead of having to do more of the small math and other or classes. All right. So what advice would you offer to our audience of school district staff and outside agencies uh, who are interested in helping all youth discover their passions and interests as they basically move through high school? Really, this is, these programs that I've gone through so far, they're probably some of the best things that I could find because this helps get a kid into a correct going set mindset for, yes, this is how working is, and it's not always going to have a bad time at work but it also includes a little bit of fun because you get to meet new people, understand different levels of job positions inside of an opponent or a factory, and it helps you build up a better way of knowing what your abilities are. All right, and also, um, as I had mentioned earlier, you are in the Army Reserve. Um, kind of how did you get connected to the military um, and how has it had a positive impact on your career to date? 
um, with Army Reserves, um, with the factory with Mulatto, um, they really help work around with a lot of veterans and those currently serving. And it helps really a lot for really getting an understanding of being able to spread um, really what is out there for everybody. So for me, uh, joining the military, uh, kind of talked with um, recruiters at the county fair in Glenwood City and just they were really helpful with getting me into it and then taking it back to a lot of um, the information I've gathered from being a generator repair for the military helps me with um, wiring diagrams and schematics that we can go and use on some more of the equipment that we have. All right. Thank you. Um, Brian, was there anything else that I had missed or that you wanted to make sure we touched base on? So, J Javen, you're it sounds like your military career really kind of links up really well with your registered adult apprenticeship and can open some doors for you to expand into other areas at Nulato. Is that correct? Yes. And when you came back from basic training, you had already had that level one and level two YA experience. Did it make basic training easier for you? In a sense, yeah, I would say it did because it already gave me a sense of teamwork that would help get us through some of the more challenging aspects in basic. I kind of figured that you would answer that question that way because I was I was in the military too and I went through when I was in high school. Um, I did a split option program and it was really good for me as a young person who I struggled with attention deficit disorder. And I, I went to a private school, so I didn't have um, an IEP per se. Um, and we didn't have the tech, ed, the tech ed programs where I went to school. So it's, it's really nice and refreshing to hear you talk about getting connected to te technical education and um, having those hands-on classes is, was really valuable for you. I'm, I'm hoping that, Brenda, we have some questions that have come in the chat. Hey, Brian, can I throw something out there real quick? Sure. Absolutely, Gary. So I saw a couple of the notes pop up, and in one of them, with regard to bringing um, YAs into our company, there's not many things that you have to avoid. Uh, what we did have to avoid was the students couldn't use cranes in our facility. We have fork trucks, cranes, different types of lifts, and then couldn't use like table saws and those types of things. So there's just a few things that they couldn't do here until they turned 18 years old. And then the next part of that is uh, we have reviews with them, just like you'd have an annual review at work. And so Julie and myself would sit down, and in this case with Javen, and we were going through, you know, what do you want to do? What are you trying to accomplish? And he said, well, you know, I'd like to go to the military. And so we were able to set up uh, – a position for him that allowed him to get through high school. And then it was really quick after high school, he went into the military and, and took care of his basic training. And that got extended a little bit with COVID. And then we had a spot waiting for him when he got back here. And, and that's a testimony to these young guys that are coming in and going, okay, I, I kind of know what I'd like to do. And if they vocalize that with this, so that, that we can kind of keep an eye out to, you know, this, is, this seems to be a really good young man and he's trying to get here and we're going to need a, we're going to need a person there at about the time that they're ready. So we do a lot of that targeting and grooming with these, these guys to um, get them ready to, to fit into a position at our company. Thank you, Gary. That really makes a lot of sense and, and puts a lot of perspective on the pieces that sometimes it's just about having, you know, courageous conversations with, 
with businesses and and getting the right matches with students. So this takes us back to academic and career planning at its roots and engaging students in age appropriate transition assessments and really thinking collectively with them about this is something you really seem very passionate about and then channeling that through their 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 course of study and and really having the rigor be high and having high expectations um, because all students can be successful and and Gary your testimony to you know taking a chance is there there's an element of risk for you as a company when you engage in youth apprenticeships but the risk is must be uh, outgained by the reward. Yeah, and, and it's actually pretty low because when they come to us, uh, the school will say, okay, Dave would have said, Jabin, we'd like to have him come in and we do an interview with them and, and we get a good understanding of what they've done in their, um, in their, um, in their towns and in their schools and, and hobbies and stuff like that. And not everybody gets in. It's, you've got to be a, kind of the right person to fulfill the spots that are out there. I think Gary, you can be a really good sounding board for other manufacturing facilities around the state because there are some exceptions to the child labor laws for building trades and manufacturing when you're a student learner. Mm -hmm. um, David, let's maybe remind each other as we get closer to the end to put that into the chat. Okay. Um, I know there is a document that's probably been revised a bit um, that talks about some of the things that a student learner can do in manufacturing that uh, they couldn't do if they weren't a student learner. Yep, some of them, they can start doing it at um, 16. So like I said, junior uh, year, once they enroll in the program, the student learner classification allows them to um, operate certain tools or equipment uh, that normally they would have to wait until they're 18. Yep. Um, there are some on that list, there's some not, and I'll try and remember to uh, have you put that into the chat then later. Perfect. Thank that you. Was great timing, because that was one of the questions that was kind of alluded to about, you know, uh, school districts running into problems with that 18 year old age kind of barrier. If you put those resources in, that would be great. We do have some questions. Before I get to the questions, I just want to say we also have some shout outs to um, David that you're a rock star and you've got a great program. But Javen, lots of comments, lots of congratulations, impressive resumes. Thank you for sharing your story too. So um, I don't know if you can peek into the chat and you wanna see what folks are writing. Um, but yes, we do have some questions. So uh, one of the questions is do employees, so I think this is more for Gary, do employees have any type of mentorship training to work with students who are in the youth apprenticeship program? Yeah, so um, when they come into our area, let's say they go into the maintenance group, for example, uh, they've got a, a, a mentor there, and it's either, it, it's generally our maintenance supervisor or our maintenance manager. And, and what they do is they uh, give them direction and stuff, but they keep a close eye on them. You know, they're... Uh, not that they would get picked on here, but they make sure they don't get picked on, right? And they don't, they make sure they're not teased. It's uh, part of our company is professional, responsible and organized. And, and we live that every day and we make sure that people treat each other that way. And then the other part of it is um, as they're going through their activities, there's checkpoints that the, uh, the student and the mentor go through just to make sure that we're on track with each other because they have to hit a certain um, score, if you would. And that score just really means that, yep, in the case with Jabe, and he's getting the right kind of attention and we're getting the right kind of results back. And, and that's different than the reviews that we do. So there's there's checkpoints all along the way to, to make sure that the, the young people are are being uh, well cared for. And Thank you for that. Brenda, any other questions at all? Yep, there's a few. So the next one is for Jabe and Gary and David. What are the next steps for you gentlemen as it relates to your roles? 
well, <laughs> David brings me people when we do it again. And we just keep circulating them through. The, our growth is kind of ridiculous here. And so I, I simply can't get enough people. And then David looks for good fits for us. And then we'll have our, our um, Youth Apprentice Day. And then we get to see the kids. The kids get to see us. And it's actually a pretty good time. And, and, we, and not everybody wants to be with Nolato, right? And, and, and vice versa. But for those who are a really good fit, then we, we start the ball rolling again and, and, and do it again. So for me, basically, um, it's actually starting right around now. Um, mm -hmm. Our students are starting to get ready to sign up for classes. Um, we can enroll students in the YA program as early as I think it's June 1st. Um, so I start looking through the current list of sophomores and juniors, um, try and pick out students who I think would be a good fit in different places. Um, or if I've heard that they have an interest in a specific career, um, or already have jobs that might tie into the youth apprenticeship program, um, then I'll start trying to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, let them know about the program, um, help promote it to them. Um, within our district, we also sometimes send out surveys. Um, so um, Gary, hopefully I'll be in contact with you soon. I have a student who responded that they have an interest in manufacturing. So I'm <laughs> trying to convince them that uh, you might be a good fit for them. And I, uh, Hopefully here in another couple of months, we'll, you'll be getting an application from them. Um, but as far as like walking the students through, I get them signed up for the program. Um, I participate in some of the reviews as it goes throughout the year. Um, within my district, I have it so that each quarter has a specific task that's supposed to be completed. Um, first quarter is getting any type of paperwork in. Second quarter is um, the first of three scheduled reviews, and then they do one for each of the last three quarters, um, with the end uh, end review being also one that they have to fill out a um, survey for. Um, and then basically I'll restart the entire process again the next year, unless it's a student who does a two-year program. Um, and then they're basically just doing a second set of uh, checklists as they go through that second year. Well, Steven, how about you? What's You might have covered a, a little bit about what's next for you. Yeah, um, really the next steps for me is to uh, get through the RA program as the setup technician and be ready to have a good job once I'm done going through there. Then we did have a question. I, uh, let's see. What percentage of youth apprenticeships stay with the same company after high school, like Jabin's planning on doing? Does anybody know? What those so we have are? four of them that went from YA to RA, and then we've probably had, uh, it, I bet you it's probably in that 40% of them continue on into the RA program when they're done with us. Um, from my experience with the students that I've worked with, um, I'd say it's probably a little bit lower than that. Mm -hmm. um, just because some of my students have a job right now that ties into the YA program and they like to do it for um, some of the added benefits of the program. Um, but they might not be staying there because I'll use healthcare for instance. I'll have quite a few students who are doing CNA and work as a nursing assistant. Um, but their plan might be to go into a, a different form of nursing or to go into um, the actual medical field as a doctor. So as a result, they'll end up going into um, the university and then they wouldn't be at that same company anymore. Thank you. And I don't know if Darlo or Katie or Danny, if you guys have any of those state statistics on youth apprenticeship, if you could drop those in the chat too, or Brian, Tom, I think is on here too. Um, we did have another question for Jabin. It sounds as if, or as though you knew you wanted to join the military. What suggestions would you offer to students that are still unsure of what they want to do? Um, so really, uh, I really didn't know what I really wanted to do when I joined the military. That was just a kind of a spur of the moment kind of a go through. But as soon as we figured out what the job was that, or my MOS was going to be. 
I was really just happy with it. Um, going through the schooling for it made me really happy. Um, I'd say any uh, for suggestions, I'd say um, find out if really if they're more of a hands-on just types of way that they learn really helps out because a lot of the hands-on kind of kids would do more of the hands-on types of learning more than a person who probably learns more through book work because they might be looking more to like an office job than they are a manufacturing or service job. So really it just depends. Um, I guess the really big suggestion that I can give there would be uh, to try and see what students are, what kind of learners and see if you can't try and pique an interest with those kinds of ways to target them. Some pretty fantastic advice. So thank you for that. Well said. Uh, yeah, I know. I was like hearing transition assessment, person-centered yeah. planning, self-advocacy <laughs> in there. And then we have one last question. Um, David, for districts that are looking to start up this kind of partnership, how do you, where do you start or how did you start building these? Um, well, to be honest, uh, the partnership that I have with Nolato, um, I just kind of, I guess, to a certain degree fell into it. Um, they're very active within CISA 11. Um, they attend the different YA events and some of the other CTE um, centered programs that happen up there, or at least happened when we could meet in person. Um, so that's where I was first introduced to Julie. Um, and basically it, it came to the point where I had a student who wanted to do a YA, wasn't exactly sure what they wanted to do as a YA. Um, their career choice was electrical engineering. So there's a little bit of crossover between some of the things that you can do in manufacturing and electrical engineering. So I talked to them um, and that's kind of how that got started. Um, other businesses that I've worked with, it's because the students already have the job there. And then I'll just, um, you know, start meeting with the employer because the student is interested. Um, I'll respond to emails, phone calls, that kind of stuff. Um, I've had a few businesses actually reach out to the district saying that we're looking for employees. Um, is there anything you can do to help us? Sometimes it's, you know, they want graduates. And then from there, you can start introducing uh, the youth apprenticeship program. Um, or sometimes I just put out a, a big display that I, I purchased through the YA funds um, in our front lobby when we have uh, sporting events and different things like that. So people from the community can come in and see it and um, hopefully get an interest in uh, doing it that way. And then, of course, there's always Facebook. <laughs> Some good marketing tools in there. Uh, I love that idea of putting something up when you have families and people coming into your district. Um, one last question did come in for you, Jabin. Do you think that the tour of Nolato was key for you to want to be engaged with youth apprenticeship there? Uh, I really do think it was because really I wasn't really sure what I really wanted to do. And a lot of places that I know of don't really do a lot of like for manufacturing, there's not really a lot of companies that will actually do tours. And so being able to see the type of environment that uh, Nalato has was kind of the main key for me to be like, yeah, I kind of want to work in this kind of environment, knowing how these people all work together. And Jabin, you had, you had, to, when we were talking um, a couple of weeks ago, and, and by the way, I, I really enjoyed our conversation because uh, we got to talk a little bit about the military and uh, that made me think about my, my younger days being in the military and it was just refreshing to talk to you. You had said something about your, you have built in time in your schedule to go to school. Can you talk a little bit about what days of the week that is and what that looks like for you getting paid? Um, so for, um, with the RA program for me right now as a setup technician, uh, every Friday, um, I, will clock into work or if I'm off like I am uh, next week, um, I just put in a notification to my manager saying, hey, school is this week. 
and and uh, normally for me right now, um, due to COVID, we do it every other week in person, and then the off weeks we do it online. Um, so what we'll do is I'll go in from about seven to about ten a.m. and work, and then from ten a.m. to about uh, three thirty. When we do in person, I drive to campus and do the schooling. And then once I'm done with schooling, I drive back to work, clock back in and go back to work for the rest of the day. So in essence, Javen, you're getting paid <clears throat> clock hours to be in class. Yep. That's pretty awesome. And in your, uh, your registered adult apprenticeship has levels to it, right? So you, you're in, you're in level one. Yep. There's throughout uh, an allowed contour, uh, each position has different levels of growth. Um, we always start out on level one. Uh, next would be uh, get complete through level one. And then I would go into a level two uh, setup tech apprentice, which would cover more areas of what that job entails. And, and, but and those aren't um, those aren't related to the RA program. That's our own internal uh, program. Now we've the, the RA program fits real nicely. So stuff that Javen completes, uh, he's got task lists that he has to do for our level one, level two, and level three technicians, and they're purposely fit so that he gets the training, gets hands on, and then he gets it checked off on his learning a living. We call it. Oh, okay, so then. Javen, when you finish all of your your levels that are required with Nulato and you finish that registered adult apprenticeship, uh, what will be the the end you know product for you or the the end goal in a couple of years? Um, really, I wouldn't mind trying to help train a few of the new tech apprentices that we might have coming into the factory. Um, I really enjoy working at a lot of contour and try and see if I can't work my way up into the company a little bit more than what I am. And some answer. of the things that we do is through the RA program, they get their um, state journeyman's card. And then also with a few more hours, they get a, I think it's kind of like an associates of general uh, education or something to that order. And then part of that is transferable to uh, universities if they would like to go that route. And so we have one that's just finishing up his RA program and will be going in. He's really, really thinking hard of going to uh, Stout for the plastics program. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of platforms here. I mean, lots of opportunities, lots of doors that get opened and, you know, Javen, I think Gary really liked your answer about advancing at Nulato. Um, <laughs> I think I think you you've picked a good company and and they've picked a good uh, a good youth and 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 Javen had a good teacher. So that's really, I mean, this is what the community of practice is really all about is is bringing everything together, and uh, that's why I, I thought this would be a great third you know, webinar. And um, again, we, we really want to have another uh, webinar sometime in the spring where we can bring closure to this and then get you ready to, to make change in your districts, make change in your communities. And uh, in order to do that, we have to have uh, good stories. Uh, success stories are, are really motivating. Uh, they create a lot of energy. So hopefully, uh, you know, Gary and David and Javen have, have created a lot of energy for you to, to go back and, and engage in some good conversations with people that are like-minded. And, and you'll also have people that you'll, you'll have to, uh, you know, be patient and, and uh, provide them with, you know, resources to change practices. And uh, Brenda, any, any other questions come in? I'm just going to say, Brian, there was another question that might help some of the district's give them a tip how to get in the door. Um, there's a question for Gary. 
one of the things that Jabin had mentioned or alluded to was that local companies don't always allow tours. So given the local or the employment scenario you described, why do you think competitors wouldn't want to open their doors to their future um, and show the culture they have for them? Yeah, it's, it's really strange. And Eric and I at WITC struggle with this because we'll get a bunch of the local molding shops together. And, and what we'll hear is, you guys are just doing this to try to steal our employees and stuff like that. And it is so far away from that. The, the intent is if we can grow all of our businesses here together, it's great for all of us. And, and there's no intention of uh, stealing personnel. And, and actually, I would argue if you think that way, you probably have to change the way you do business because you should be growing to keep uh, people coming. Well, Tom says, go Gary, grow your company. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Martin. Hey, Tom. <laughs> I think that was, Brian, all we had for questions. Anything else comes up, drop it in the chat. Hey, uh, I got one more if I could. Yes. Just thinking about it. And the uh, so a long time ago, I don't know how many years, I actually quit high school when I was 16 and worked at a molding shop uh, similar to this. But I got into an apprentice program in northern Illinois associated with this. And it's kind of crazy. I spent more time in school the last 40 years than the first 16 years of just trying to get through high school. So it, the apprenticeship program makes a huge, it can make a huge uh, positive in, in someone's life. And ironically, I ended up with a master's in engineering, even though I quit high school when I was a kid. It's just weird how life rotates around. And a lot of it was I had a really good company similar to what Nolato Contour is. And they said, no, no, you're going to apprenticeship program. Turned out really good for me. I'd say <laughs> you've done, you've done very well. And you, I can't thank you enough for, you know, being with us today. And we thought we were only going to get you for a half hour. And yeah, yeah. it sounds like we're going to get you for the whole hour. <laughs> it sounds good. Yeah. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions, I'd, just have a couple more uh, little nuggets. Um, Darla, uh, I know Darla, you, you had mentioned um, in an email that you have knowledge of that, uh, those manufacturing uh, specifications. If you could put that in the chat, Darla, that'd be awesome. The child labor law exceptions for manufacturing and building trades. And then Brian, did you wanna end the recording quick before you finished up? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.